Hello, everybody. My name is Joe Rox. Um, just like to keep it relatively informal. If everyone has anyone has questions, comments, anything you you know see as I start talking here, feel free to raise your hand or shout out. I'm not very formal at all, so I'm gonna do that. Um, like Jason said, I work for the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, I've been in a couple of different corps offices and through the government. I used to work in Buffalo District Corps of Engineers, and that's where I actually started learning about ice and ice control structures and river engineering and everything we do. Um, Krell is, we're not just river ice people like you're gonna hear about today. I gotta give at least a little blurb on Krell. Um, so Krell is part of, uh, we're kind of one of, uh, there's seven labs across the US that's uh, ERDIC comprises the Engineering Research and Development Center. So all the different labs we kind of hit on every single possible engineering topic you can think of, and we're just the research and development arm for the Army and for the Army Corps. Um, there's a, a number of the locations, physically a, a, four main locations around the country, and then a number of field offices, and we range from you know everywhere down at Vicksburg, Mississippi is the headquarters, we've got offices in Alaska, we're all over the place. Um, so Krell, specifically, it really formed in its, um, the way it's set up today in the early 1960s. Um, we've got about 260, I think, right now, employees uh, that are stationed mainly in Hanover, New Hampshire. We're right up the road from Dartmouth College on the Connecticut River, right between uh, next to Vermont and uh, um, New Hampshire, right about halfway up. And we also have field stations, like I said, um, main other one is uh, outside Fort Wainwright in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, they have a permafrost tunnel where a lot of research has gone on. Um, other folks at Krell, we work on the polar e-polar program, so there's a lot of remote sensing work down in um, you know the Antarctic, uh, at both the South Station and McMurdo. We study everything and anything you can think of as it comes as it relates to cold and austere environments so we've got an agronomist on staff that just look there's all kinds of crazy stuff they do at Krell um, <coughs> anything like you said that has to do with cold so the agronomist that kind of stuff is something where they, they'll look at um, uh, spent munitions and you know they'll clean up ordnance ranges you know for the army and that's something with like phytoremediation with plants and then there's also just biogeochemical engineers that you know work on these things there's um, pretty much anything you can think of cold we do so my point to that is really just if you have issues or problems or things that are related to cold climates and it's not discussed here today Krell may very certainly be able to help you and I can help direct you to someone else besides me there so with that you can get started a little bit here today what I'm gonna go over is I don't know I'll try to keep it it's not too boring. Hopefully nobody will fall asleep, but it's probably the, uh, the, the more science and engineering side of, of all of this. Um, everything's set up for a mixed audience, so it's not all equations or anything. Don't worry. It's, um, but we're going to go through river ice processes. We'll talk about ice formation, the different mechanisms by which river ice breaks up. Uh, we'll go through different types of ice jams. And then we'll have a little bit of a selfless plug about Krell's Ice Jam database. We'll have just a couple of slides about what we have in that database for Pennsylvania. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about different mitigation techniques and the, the different things that, you, that have been done and can be done to combat flooding and damage from ice jams. So to start off with river ice formation, really have, we're going to keep this simple you know, for the sake of time. Um, but we're going to assume that there's really only two contrasting cases. Uh, first, you would have a surface ice cover, a thermally grown ice form. And that's in the, you can compare or say that that's where, you know, lakes, reservoirs, or very slow moving rivers without a lot of wind mixing. Alternatively, you have rivers where there's, you know, higher velocities, um, or there's on a, a, a still body lake or pond or something where there is a lot of wind mixing and that's where you'd see more frazzle ice production. We're not going to get into a whole lot on surface ice growth here in this presentation. Um, just for simplicity's sake, we'll say that we have methods of estimating it based on air temperature and accumulated freezing degree days. 
there has been you know research done on this. Krell has publications out on this. There's methods to estimate how thick ice is going to grow due to air temperature, and a lot of people are probably familiar with this. But if you're not, or you have questions or want to talk about it more, you know, we can feel free to contact me after and we can go through that. But we're not going to go through all the details or you know any of this right now. Basically, it's just if you you can estimate this coefficient alpha here based on the, the type of water body you're in, the type of how much wind mixing there is, how big the river is, there's published uh, approximate ranges for that. And you can use that with the accumulated freezing degree days, which is just based on air temperature, the you know discrepancy between that and freezing. And you can come up with an estimated thickness of ice due to you know that AFDD. Um, the, uh, obviously can be made more complicated than that, but we don't really need to go into that for our purposes here. So we'll leave surface ice formation alone from there and just move on to frazzle. So frazzle ice, the, the theory is that the, the way this works that from observations and experiments, the, it really, it only forms in areas of open water. And what that is to say is that once, if you're in a system where Frazzle ice may be produced in the beginning of the season, but then generally you do have a surface ice cover form. Once there's an ice cover over water, that, that section of the river you know, will no longer produce frazzle ice. Frazzle ice could still pass through. It can still be produced from somewhere further upstream that's not covered by a surface ice yet, but uh, it, for the most, it, cases, it's, it's not going to create new frazzle ice in that reach anymore. So the only time that you're worried about frazzle ice production is when it's open to the atmosphere. Um, it also has to be formed in turbulent water, which means, you know, it's driven mainly, uh, you know, by not only air temperature, but by the actual flow velocity or, and or by how much wind mixing is going on. Um, the theory also states that frazzle is, it, it really is only formed in super cooled water. And what that means is that the, the water is actually a hundred <coughs> degree below the freezing point. So, and the way that that works is it just has to do with, um, it, because of turbulence in the water, shear stresses uh, and friction, the, the water, it has to get even colder than the freezing temp for frazzle ice to form. Um, and what, the way that, that the reason that's important, the way that works is if the only way that that happens is if the water itself, the surface of the water, is exposed to atmospheric conditions that are well below the freezing point. So, and that theory also states once you have surface ice cover on top of it, that interface of ice and water, where the the bottom of the ice meets the top of the water, that is, we assume that is always at. 32 Fahrenheit, zero Celsius. So that's kind of how this all comes around. Like if you can believe it, prove it to yourself in your head, that's how it works. It has to be open to the atmosphere or else you can't produce frazzle for these reasons. And that'll make more sense. There's, that makes more sense as we go on or ask, as you ask questions and see things. So what we're gonna go through now is just we have a series of photos um, that describe the progression of frazzle ice as it moves through a river system and downstream. First, you're gonna have um, just the, the slush that you can see <coughs> be mostly suspended, you know, in the water column floating on top. You could pick some up in your hand like this, but it's not big chunks or even like snowball sized things. It's just kind of floating in the water. It looks maybe a little hazy or cloudy. If you scoop your hand in, this is what it would look like when you pick it up. As it continues to move downstream, it starts to, more frazzle comes together, it starts to flock together, similar to, you know, the way we would talk about flocculation in like water treatment or anything else. But one of two things will happen, and that really is dependent on the, the individual physics of that stretch of the river. It has to do with geometry, slope, um, flow velocity, a whole bunch of different things come into play, but it'll either flock together and stay suspended as frazzle up here, or it can actually start to adhere to the bed and the substrate as anchor ice. Um, anchor ice is primarily, it's composed of frazzle ice that has 
frozen to boulders, cobble, bed substrate in the river, and then it accumulates on top of itself. So if we ignore anchor ice and we look at the, the fragile ice that continues to flock together and move downstream, the next kind of progression is into this pancake ice. And you can see this on rivers and lakes, uh, you know, where wind mixing occurs. As we move further downstream and those pancakes come together, you'll we'll start to get kind of the uh, width of the channel um, groupings uh, that we call flows, where usually this is where the, the flow velocity starts to slow down, the river channel is starting to shallow out, the river may get wider in this section, and, or it could be a bend or something where it's just everything slows down on you know, the outside edge, and these uh, pancake ice starts to come together and form these flows that are the, the whole channel width. Um, from here, as they can, they can do one of two things, depending on flow, uh, velocities, atmospheric conditions, it can either stay together in these flows um, each of these bands, if you will, there, they can come together and form a sheet, and then depending on atmospheric conditions, they can freeze in place and form a, what looks to be like, you know, cover, a whole ice cover. It's just not thermally grown. It's frozen in place frazzle. Or um, if the atmospheric conditions, you know, warm up and flow increases, or there's a rain on snow event or something like that, um, they could break apart again and move downstream to another location until uh, you know conditions warrant that they would actually come together and, and form a ice cover again. So that's really all we're going to go into on like frazzle <laughs> production and progression as it moves downstream. Um, I'm going too fast. Any questions, or are we bored and falling asleep already? Um, so with it, we'll go into ice jam categories now. <coughs> There's kind of, we're just going to break these up into two different time periods, if you will, in the winter. You can have ice jams that form during river ice formation periods. So that would be like earlier in the winter from, you know, December to January before any kind of, um, you know, midwinter thaw type event, and these would be primarily freeze-up jams and anchor ice dams. And that's because, if you remember, you know, those freeze-up jams typically occur at the beginning of the winter because everything is still open. There's no ice cover over any of the rivers to prevent frazzle production. And if you have a quick drop in temperature that's sustained for a longer period of time, um, specifically bitterly cold and clear nights, um, no, no clouds, you know, or anything like that. That tends to help produce more frazzle faster uh, in a shorter period of time, you know, just a few nights, and you can have a huge amount of frazzle pumped into a system that you know can cause a jam. Um, obviously, the, the, it's the same thing. You know, anchor ice dams can form quickly like that because the river's open, so it can have a lot more heat loss if it's open to the atmosphere with no ice cover, and if you're in a section of a stream or river where anchor ice forms, they, that's when they'll form is typically earlier in the winter before ice cover is on top. Um, later in the you know winter or early spring, that's where we'll typically see breakup. Um, during you know these breakup we'll see breakup jams, which is when you know ice cover actually breaks, larger huge chunks of ice move down the river and gets you know stopped on some obstruction that we'll get into later. Uh, alternatively, you can have what we call a midwinter jam, and it's the same mechanically. It's the same thing as a breakup jam. It's just it occurs in say January instead of March or April. And the reason we at Pearl we make a distinction between them is just because the more often than not, depending on where you are geographically and what your climate's like, in March or April you have a breakup jam. It could stay in place for hours to a week or two, you know, it's, but generally the trend of the climate is to continue warming once a breakup jam in March or something happens. In a mid-winter jam, as we call it that, it's a breakup jam that occurs in like middle of January like we had last year where everything was really cold December and beginning of January and then everything warmed up to like 60 degrees out for two days. All that surface ice cover broke up and moved downstream, so we had breakup jams form. But then it got bitterly cold the next week, within a few days of that. So all of those breakup jams, which we're calling midwinter jams, they froze in place and they stayed there 
weeks or months on end until the spring came and actually warmed up enough to melt them. Um, that's weird. Must be a weird time to live in that. Um, but that's why we call those midwinter jams. Here. So talk about freeze up jams and kind of um, just their standard, you know, uh, issues, progression, all that. Really, like we said before, early to midwinter formation, when you have uh, freezing, you know, sub-freezing air temperatures, they're usually the jam itself of a freeze-up jam is comprised of mainly frazzle ice, surface ice that may have been on the, the, the sides of a river or creek or in any kind of eddies or anything like that that got broken up and moved down. Um, they're typically insidious, meaning there's really no way to stop the arriving ice. If the uh, atmospheric conditions, you know, the weather conditions are to continue and it's going to stay cold out because there's no ice cover upstream, you know, on the rivers yet at this point, it's pretty much impossible to stop frazzle from being formed. You, it's just going to keep pumping into the jam, building up behind a, a jam in place until either it breaks free or freezes in place or something like that. Um, and the reason that's important to remember or know is that that plays into, you know, mitigation techniques and things that we'll talk about later. Uh, it's unlikely to release, like I said, until it warms up outside. And the paradox here, the paradox here is that it's typically occurring in fairly steady flow to declining flow conditions. And what that means is you're not if you're just looking at a hydrograph on like, you know, gauge data or something from USGS or, you know, the, any of the local gauges, anything you might have, um, you, you may just see the, you know, flow or water just it, it, it decreasing with time. And the issue there is that that is, if you're not experiencing this or haven't seen this before, you can kind of be like, oh, you know, flow's going down. We're not going to have a problem. There's no chance of flooding. Well, that doesn't matter if the whole channel is plugged up with ice, you know, any amount of water flow behind it, you know, plug up your bathroom sink and turn it on a trickle, give it a few minutes and the whole thing overflows, it doesn't matter. Um, but the reason that occurs is because you're in these sub-freezing, you know, really cold periods of time when you, ground flow is decreasing, everything is, you know, slowing down for the winter, you don't have rain happening typically during when it's really cold out like that, you've got snow occurring, you don't have any influx to the river itself. Um, so it, you got to look at more than one source. This is where folks like, you know, river ice spotters, observers, anyone in the community that's used to looking for these things and noticing them, you know, that all matters because the looking at trends in gauge data don't really help when you have something instantaneously just plug up the channel. So here's just a, I don't know, this is like, 1990s crummy little drawing or a section of a uh, freeze up jam. The, the main takeaway here is that there's really no flow typically through the ice jam itself. The, 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 the flow area is very restricted because this ice is it's all this slush and frazzle and everything that is just really tightly packed often you know, in the jams. It can have the pieces of like broken border ice, you know, surface ice there. Um, sometimes what can happen is you'll have the initial ice jam form here, and then water will start to rise behind that jam. Stage will increase behind it. You may have some flow from water get on top of that frazzle, you know, jam, that freeze up jam. Over the course of, you know, a few hours or overnight, a couple days, that may refreeze, and it'll look nice and smooth. Um, if you have some kind of increase in flow or just continued, you know, uh, stage rise behind it, like because it's blocked the whole channel, you may have a, uh, another night goes by where you have a huge influx of frazzle from upstream. The water may rise up on top of the jam again. More frazzle ice could get deposited on top of the jam, and then that could freeze in place. And it'll just look like this crusty, uh, slushy, you know, relatively smooth surface. Um, and where that's important is all goes back to you know making observations, um, telling local emergency managers you know what you see out there. This uh, or you know for any kind of long-term you know mitigation study or something we'd be involved in. If you can look at the ice jam from a distance and you know make these type of observations, you have a it's pretty easy to tell the difference between freeze-up jams. 
so here's an example of what a freeze-up jam can look like after you know some additional frazzle gets pumped down on top of it and refreezes in places like the Grand River in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This is pretty common. They see this kind of stuff almost every year. You know, these freeze-up jams happen right in downtown. All the the uh, slower velocities. It's uh, where the river kind of shallow, you know, the, the slope of the river shallows out. They've got a bunch of bridges and constrictions in the river there, so all the frazzle that comes downstream just stops breaking down. Um, so we'll move away from frazzle ice and freeze up jams now, and we'll go talk a little bit about break up itself, and then we'll, then we'll go into break up jams. So there's really two mechanisms, we'll call it, by which river ice will break up. There's Thermal breakup and mechanical. Thermal breakup is when you have a nice, slow, gradual warm up, you know, in the, the atmosphere. Spring kind of comes on nice and easy, and everything melts out slow, and we don't have any river ice problems, and everybody sleeps well at night, and we love it. It never happens. Alternatively, mechanical breakup is when you really don't need to have any deterioration of the ice cover, but if you have an increase in flow, you just induce stress into the ice cover itself until you get to a point that you cause fra cracks and fractures and then ultimately it fragments and flow starts to carry these pieces downstream and causes us all kinds of headaches and grief. Usually it's a combination of both of these you know, um, mechanisms. Um, mechanical breakups much more dramatic, dangerous, <coughs> increased flow, large volume of ice fragments, problems, problems. To go back to thermal meltdown, really what you'll you'll see is this: if you have a long gradual warming period, you don't really have any rain yet. This this early part of the spring, the ice cover will just start to slowly thin, weaken. You may start to see some dark spots uh, that are where it's melting in place. Um, you may have flow on top of some of the ice, like in the, the picture in the top right there. Uh, if it does break up and move, generally because that ice cover has already thinned and weakened, you, these jams will be a little weaker themselves. They, uh, they, the ice will continue to deteriorate as it warms up with the increased flow coming through, you know, the water temp being warmer than the ice, and they'll eventually break up, move through quickly, or melt in place and not cause us a whole lot of problems. When you have a mechanical breakup, though, everything's a little different. The ice itself is still strong. It hasn't, each piece of ice has not been weakened by melting yet a whole lot. But what will happen is you'll have an increase in flow. It can be from rain, snow melt, or a dam release where you've got, you know, uh, any, of, any of those things going on. The faster the rate of rise, you know, the more effective the, the fracturing is going to be. Typically, what happens depends on the river and the size of the river, but typically, in larger river systems, the, the ice cover, the connection with the banks is what will happen first. So you'll have these like two parallel cracks along the river. Um, from that, then really all of that ice as it moves downstream it just has to overcome the channel constrictions, the geometry you know, that it sees. So anywhere you've got bends in the river sinuosity, anywhere you've got constrictions, can be either in width <coughs> or depth. So where you, uh, you can a, a pinch point, you know, like this constriction, it doesn't necessarily just have to be where the river, you know, from plan view horizontally is is uh, constricted or tight. It can also be where you've got some kind of grade control, whether it be man-made or natural. If, um, you know, in rivers where there's bedrock, you know, or something come up close to the surface, if there's a, a, a very shallow section, whereas upstream was deeper and, and flowed easier, that ice is going to have a hard time getting through a vertical constriction in the river too, um, or any kind of barriers like bridge piers or you know abutments or things like that can be issues. Uh, the, as the channel ice begins to move, there's a feedback with flow. Obviously, increased flow can you know help push the ice through. Um, and then as it moves downstream, typically those pieces they'll as they bump into each other and you know melt and move, they fracture into smaller and smaller pieces. Of So for like a typical breakup jam, it's just a quick schematic and then a couple of photos to give some uh, context here. What we call, the way we call this, you know, 
flow is to the right, so downstream we call the toe of the jam, which is at the initiation point. Um, in this example, the initiation point the, the, uh, is an existing ice cover on the river. And this is very typical of what will happen. The uh, downstream ice cover, usually rivers, they break up from upstream to downstream, just you know, to make it even more difficult and everything. <laughs> the, uh, the, the ice cover that's downstream stays in place uh, for longer than ice cover upstream, <coughs> usually, and that's due to just increases in flow, start from upstream to downstream. You know, a lot of time that's how it works. So that stays in place as the breakup ice is coming downstream, it sees that solid ice sheet, hits it, can't go anywhere, causes a jam. As we move upstream, you kind of end up getting to a point where the, the, the thickness of the ice jam is meeting like an equilibrium. Uh, eventually, you'll have just where you'll see open water through the pieces of ice, and we call that the head of the jam there. Um, example of what it would look like, uh, but pretty, pretty standard. Standard for a breakup jam is what it looks like. So the, you can contrast this cross-section of jam to what we saw before of a freeze-up jam, where because the, there really isn't a frazzle in a breakup jam a whole lot, usually it's just large and small pieces of ice, there's interstitial flow, there's porosity to this. So you will have flow through these ice jams. You may see the water right up on top, you know, next to the, the ice pieces and all. Um, but there's there, there can be, you know, slush and smaller pieces of ice, but it's not nearly as full of slush or anything as a freeze-up jam would be. Um, just kind of saying it in different words than we've already said, but breakup ice jams form when the ice flow transport capacity of the channel is exceeded. You know, anywhere that it, the, the river can't get that ice through, that's just where it's going to stop. And those locations can be things like intact ice sheets, any kind of um, dramatic change in slope, one way or the other, um, and that's that is explained or makes sense because a lot of the times, anytime you have a, a change in slope, whether you're going from a steep slope of the river to a shallow slope or shallow and pitching off, at that point, there's usually a constriction vertically in the river. Usually, it's it's uh, shallow at those points, um, and that's especially when you're dropping off. Um, and that issue, that's where all the ice will see, and it just will end up hitting <coughs> the ground or hitting the banks or you know, or getting caught on something, and then it just piles up on top of itself and can't go anywhere. Any kind of sharp bend in the river, constrictions in the river, like we said before, or barriers like bridge piers abutments. Just some examples for visual effect, if you will, of breakup jams. You can compare these back to that one on the Grand River in, in Michigan. These are just, I like to say the breakup jams, compared to a freeze-up jam, a breakup jam looks like a moonscape. I mean, you can't really mistake one for the other unless it's a unique circumstance where you've got both happening at the same time or something like that. Um, these are, these had occurred at midwinter jams. We've got you know, the Winooski there up in Vermont. That's close to home for me. The Mohawk on the right there in Schenectady, New York, and then down here on the bottom left is the Skunk River in Augusta, Iowa. Um, these are really just here to show how quickly the, re the flooding response from an ice jam can occur, uh, you, it, and it's meant to show also that, you know, like we said before, just by looking at stage data, you can't predict, you know, when an ice jam is going to happen or anything. Um, you know, that combined with weather data, you can do a, maybe a better job, we could say, when things you know, are possible, not necessarily <coughs> likely, but possible. Um, but here, you can just see that you know, the ice jam forms somewhere in the, uh, where are we here? In, in the early morning, probably, at the bottom of the chart here is where the ice probably got plugged up, and then all of a sudden, because you've still got flow behind it, just the stage picks up and causes all kinds of issues. So next slide, same idea, same thing happens, but what this is just meant to demonstrate is that just because one ice jam comes through and forms and then releases, doesn't mean there isn't another one right behind it a day or two later. That's what occurred here. So there's, there's 
the river doesn't stop flowing, if the atmosphere doesn't get warmer, the conditions can be just repeated and the possibility for a new ice jam is you know, right behind the first one always. Um, these are a couple slides we added. I don't know how much detail we want to go into this. If people have you know questions, I can fill in more. We can talk about it after the fact. These are these were just a few to show like where stage data and information can be found. The National Weather Service has a page. Um, most of these, if I'm not mistaken, come from you know they they look at USGS gauge data, you know real time gauge data. I think they get some from the Army Corps too. But they have a very nice site, the Advanced Advanced, Advanced Hydrologic Prediction Service System, System Service, I forget, <laughs> one or the other. But for all the, the gauges, you can go on there, you can see where they have um, minor, major, you know, cataclysmic flood stage, and they kind of go through typical, or not typical, but the local um, impacts at different stage elevations for this given gauge and kind of explains maybe like what roads or what vicinity in the neighborhoods can be flooding at that stage. Um, that source data, like we said before, typically come, a lot of them come from USGS gauges and you can get quite a bit of information from the USGS web pages also about the gauge itself, about the drainage area where they are. You can get the stage, you can get the discharge, you can find a lot of information on their page about that. Um, but these are just some of the things, you know, that we all look at and use, everybody here, if you're an emergency manager, you're probably familiar with all this too, but if you're interested or you, you know, want help in maybe trying to, um, you know, put together some kind of, we do a lot of work with things like early warning systems, and obviously we'll talk about that later in mitigation here. Um, about how that can help, you know, this is kind of something that would play into that type of a system. All right, any questions on the technical stuff? Jeff? Yes? I know when FEMA does the flood insurance studies, flood insurance rate maps, they do hydraulic analysis, hydraulic mm -hmm. analysis. Yep. Is there a means of doing one based on an ice jam? Uh, the short answer is yes, but and that's something we do. We work on specialized on it, Krell. But it, uh, you don't. T it, it can be. It, we have methods for including ice. Ice can be modeled in RAS. There's limitations to it. It's not perfect, just like any numerical model. Um, the way that a lot of that stuff is done for FEMA modeling, when they include ice, the, the limitation is on data. So. If we're looking at a location like up where I live in New Hampshire on the Connecticut River, northern Connecticut River, we've got background data, anecdotal data, and you know numeric data on past ice jams and stage response from that. So a lot of where we're Krell, where we come into it, there's more statistical methods that come into play, and there are ways that uh, FEMA can include you know ice in their modeling or that you know whatever contractor who's doing it can be done. Um, a lot of the time it ends up being statistical and it ends up being developing stage frequency curves. So you kind of, you look at both open water, you know, conditions of spring floods and you look at past historic ice jams that have been recorded and, and are of interest and have caused flooding. And if, if you have high water marks and things like that from them, you can look at the, the two of those things, conditions together and you can figure out, you know, obviously which one worse and through statistics you can build a new a, a combined stage frequency curve that, that takes ice jams into account. Um, if you're in an area where you don't have recorded history you know, of ice jams, where you don't have numbers on what happened and how high the water was and you know all these issues from jams, it's it's not that it we can still include, we can do ice jam modeling, you know, and, and ice modeling on those rivers, but there's uh, a lot more assumptions that come into play. So, it depends. That's the nice thing about it. And we're kind of like, a lot of, it feels like we're, like your weather matters a lot of time, you're like, nah, it depends. <laughs> because everything we do with river ice, it's very, my point of that is, is very site specific. Nothing, 
very few things can be generalized across, you know, a, an entire state, country, or even just a region. You know, it's um, a lot of things are very, very site specific, especially when we get into mitigation techniques, because there's never just an off-the-shelf solution that will work. It really depends on what uh, what constraints we have at the site and what you know resources we have in terms of geometry, geography, warm water effluent, you know, waste treatment plant, there's all kinds of stuff that come into play, what we can use, what we can't use, so. Questions, notes? If you think of something after the fact, you can always go back. Yes, sir. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on that on what you can use and what you can't use? For have a whole, that's good, Perfect. in 10 minutes, Perfect. we'll get to that section, that's the. Those are always the questions yeah. you get. Right, absolutely. 